Welcome everyone to our wet season seminar for 2018. For those of you that haven't met me before, which is probably the majority of you, uh, my name's Tim Penny. I'm an aviation safety advisor with CASA, and my role is purely safety education, human factors, training, and that type of thing. I'm not an auditor or an inspector or anything like that. My role is purely safety education. So why are we here? It's, it's obvious that there are a lot of pilots. Many pilots arrive in the top end, fresh out of flight school. Many of those flight schools are down in the southern parts of Australia. And they come up here to the top end, everywhere from Cairns to Broome, to start their careers. And they arrive up in the top end, often with only a few hundred hours at most, and with very little exposure to any real type of operational flying. And it's no secret, especially when you chat to people that have been up here for a while, that the hazards involved up here in the wet season, especially during the wet season, are quite unique, are not really found anywhere else in Australia. We're going to focus on some of the main hazards, some of the main things that can come and bite you on the backside when you're flying across the top end in the wet season, especially for the VFR pilot, and especially for the VFR pilot even in the early stages of their career. Even if you're an IFR pilot, even if you fly turbine equipment in the flight levels, even if you've been up here for many years, I'm sure there's still some very, very good information that you can take away tonight. Because understanding these hazards and understanding the risks that flow from them, guys, and the decision-making that's required, that's the vital stuff that will keep you alive. We have things like the Bureau of Meteorology. We have air traffic control. They provide services to the aviation community up here, and that's fantastic. But even the stuff that our friends in ATC and our friends at the Bureau of Met provide do have their limitations, okay? They're not always the silver bullet we may think they are. So we're gonna have a bit of a chat with our subject matter experts from Air Traffic Control and the Bureau of Met as we unlock some of the secrets of the wet season. What I'm going to do is just ask the question, what is a hazard? People go to university, they do PhDs in hazard and risk management. You can make it as complicated or as simple and straightforward or as practical as you like. Essentially, a hazard is something like that. Anyone seen that before? It was 2004. It was in Iraq during the Iraq war. It was a 100 metre by 100 metre hole in a runway about half a metre deep. You would probably call that a hazard. Put simply, guys, a hazard is anything, and this is the, the CASA definition, which we use in a lot of our literature, it's anything that is a source of potential harm. So a dirty big hole in a runway is a source of potential harm, especially if you try and land an aircraft on it. Wait till you see the next picture. Okay? That is a hazard. It's something that is a source of potential harm. And when we go flying around in the wet season across the top end, there's lots of hazards out there. It's a hazard-rich environment. It is a hazardous environment by definition because there are a lot of sources of potential harm. By the way, that was runway 33 at this airfield in Iraq. There were no runway lights. No NOTAM was issued. By itself, it was just a big hole in the concrete. Okay, the risk, I suppose, wasn't realised until something like that happens. C-130 landed and ripped the guts out of it. Bit, bit ordinary, okay. No NOTAM issued, no runway lights, okay. The hazard was realised. That hole in the runway was a source of potential harm. That was the end result, okay. The hazard was realised when someone decided to land on the runway. There are all sorts of other factors, no NOTAM, no runway lights and all the rest of it. So risk, separate from hazard, hazard's a source of potential harm. Risk is when that hazard has been realised. It's the chance that something's going to happen that's going to cause you to impact or have an impact on what you're trying to achieve. And we look at, we look at risk in, in, in the form of two things. The likelihood of it happening and the consequences if it does. That's all. We're not trying to overcomplicate things. You know, risk can either be a high risk or a low risk. Risk can either be acceptable risk or unacceptable risk. Is there any such thing, guys, as risk-free aviation? No. Risk-free aviation, you leave the aircraft in the hangar and you, walk, and you walk away. But no one has a job, 
okay? We have to accept at least some type of risk in order to turn a dollar, that's what we do. Who wants to start the ball rolling with one of the major risks that pilots face flying around the top end during the wet season? Let's go. Yes. Storms? Storms, thunderstorms, whack it down. Lines of convection. Lines of convection, yep. Very good. We could give you the metric. That's pretty excellent. Lines of convection. <laughs> what else can bite you on the bum up here? Yeah. Turbulence. Turbulence, Pete. Okay. There are also there are weather risks. There's all organisational risks. There's all sorts of risks. There's physical risks too. Give me some more, guys. Come on, let's go. Rapid change. Things change. Things change quickly. So the rapidity of change. Good one. What else? Visibility. Poor visibility. Yeah. What can cause poor visibility up here in the wet season? <coughs> Rain will do it. Okay. Dry season. Just out of interest. Dry season. You suffer from poor vis in the dry season? Yes. Yeah, because half of Arnhem Land's burning and all the smoke comes from. <laughs> what else we got? Yes. Yeah, runway conditions. Runway conditions. So things like contaminated runways. Okay. Affecting braking performance. It runs the risk of runway excursions. Runway excursions off the side or off the end. What else we got? Yeah. Animals. Animals. Elaborate on that. Like kangaroos. Kangaroos. Yeah. Are they more active in the wet season? I don't know. That's cool. <laughs> Whack it down. Wildlife. Okay. Could be all sorts of stuff. Everything from bird strikes to, you know, heaven knows what. Yeah. Uh, congestion when uh, like, say, thunderstorm shuts down at the airport. Yes. And it's banged up with aircraft. That's right. And, and RAF ATC aren't cooperating and they're being a pain. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> What else? Yep. Water and fuel, oil, glasses. Ah, contaminated fuel, probably. Maybe, maybe contaminated fuel from overwing refueling, contaminated fuel from drum stock. Yeah. What else? Keep going, guys. Yeah. Dehydration. Dehydration. Yeah, you sweat a lot, don't you? You can lose litres of fluid. Okay. Or, you know, you're in the cockpit, it's stinking hot, it's humid. What else? Think about wet season operations. Yeah. Operational pressures, Pete. Operational pressures to get the job done, especially if the weather's not cooperating. Fatigue. Fatigue. Perhaps the unpredictability of the weather and that rapidity of change, which we spoke about before. Things are rarely static for very long. Wind shear. Okay. Harry from the Bureau of Metal talk about things like low-level wind shear and gust fronts of microbursts and stuff like that. That's brilliant. Yes, sir. Um, fuel, reduce yes, reduce ability to turn a dollar because you've got to carry extra fuel for things like weather holding. Yep. Unforecast. Yep, unforecast holding. TAF said it was great, or the, the, the area forecast said the storms weren't going to roll in until a certain time. Sure enough, you get out there and they're already forming. Okay? Because the weather forecast ain't perfect. Harry will tell you that a bit later. They're not perfect. It is a forecast. Okay? It's, it's sometimes crystal ball stuff. Yeah? The road's being closed and uh, more pressure to get someone through. Yeah. If the roads are cut, there's more pressure on the pilot, there's more pressure on the company to, to make that communication link, to make that transport link. So other modes of transport, I suppose, Pete, being compromised, puts more pressure on you guys to get the job done. Last light considerations. Last light considerations. Yeah, elaborate on that a bit. Yep. 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 True. Yep. Uh, the requirement for alternates, whether planned or unplanned one, unforeseen yep. one. Yep, the requirement for alternates. And not every alternate might be suitable as an alternate. So your alternate planning has to be pretty well spot on. Just general lack of infrastructure in remote, in the remote part of the territory. Yeah. The lack of infrastructure during the wet season can really make things difficult. It's hard enough in the dry. When we can land on runways, they're not flooded. In the wet season, for those of you who haven't been up here long, everyone gets really tired because they can't sleep because there's storms. That's the pilots, the engineers, the fuelies, 
everyone associated with the aviation system yeah. can suffer from fatigue during that period. And that plays across everything yeah. we're talking about. So if everyone is under the pump, happens in the build-up, everyone goes slightly crazy, and it happens during the wet season. <laughs> so it's a layer of extra hazard over the whole system that relies on people being at their best. Mm. So often people don't operate at their best. Yeah. And we don't, yeah. Sorry, just also maybe right. like increased debris, like we're talking about runway conditions. Yeah. And I kind of more went down the water on the runway, but yeah. I guess we had a member of our work who, I don't know, a tree fell on his palm. So something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like There's all sorts of hazards with things like falling debris, blowing debris, that type of stuff. Yeah. That's it. That's probably the big one, isn't it? The VFR pilot losing the visual horizon and being stuck in cloud. Let's say the uh, threat of cyclones and everyone rushing to either secure aircraft and get them out of town. Yeah. Awesome. People having to do things too quickly. Yeah. It's interesting where Greg mentioned fatigue earlier. I'm, not, I'm just about done here, but think about how you react when you're tired. Okay? We, all, we each re react in different ways. I know when I get tired, I get short-tempered and a bit shitty. Some people get clumsy. Some people get forgetful when they're tired. Have a think about, for example, how you your, yourself react when you're tired and just keep, I suppose, a bit of a lookout for those red flags. And with regards to fatigue, the, the, the fatigue limits that we have are exactly that. They are, they are limits. It's my pleasure now to welcome Harry Burns Fab. Harry is a forecaster with the Bureau of Meteorology here in, in Darwin. Harry's going to give us a bit of a, I suppose, a cook's tour of thunderstorm activity, wet season activity, monsoon, cyclones, all that good gear. So please welcome to the floor, Harry. Uh, thanks. thanks for that, Tim. Um, I've uh, been a meteorologist up here in Darwin for about three, three years now. Um, I, uh, work out at the Casuarina office. Uh, we do the forecast for the whole of the Northern Territory, um, basically the whole of the uh, GAF area, um, and uh, a little bit in East Timor as well. Um, I've uh, specialised in aviation meteorology, um, and today I'm going to go through, uh, firstly, um, the kind of hazards to expect in the wet season, um, and then go into what products the Bureau issues in the wet season, and uh, then a little bit about uh, what kind of limitations are there on the forecast. As you, many of you know, we, we don't always get it perfect. So what does a typical wet season look like? Uh, at, at the moment, we're in, we're in October, November. It's the build-up. It's pretty hot. It's pretty humid. There's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. Everyone's sweating. We're starting to see a few storms develop. I don't know if uh, a few of you are flying, flying around today. There are a few thunderstorms didn't quite make, them, make it into Darwin. Early on in October, you get a thunderstorm, you know, once every few days if you're lucky, that kind of thing. Moving on into November, that's where we start to get a bit more moisture in the atmosphere and you start getting more regular thunderstorms. So, you know, once every second or third day kind of thing. And then right through into December, uh, the atmosphere is pretty, pretty well charged, so you start getting pretty regular thunderstorms. From here we move into a period where the monsoon can occur. We don't get a monsoon for four months straight, that'll be pretty unbearable I think. Uh, we get periods of monsoon, so that's called an active monsoon. And that's where we get you know, a few days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks of basically inclement weather, rainfall, low visibility. That's when you can get 100, 200 millimetres in a day quite easily. And that's due to this monsoonal trough flying over the top end, uh, causing a lot of uplift and there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, during this period, we also have monsoon break periods and that's where we go back to more build-up like conditions. Uh, during these periods, there's a lot more moisture in the atmosphere uh, than what there was in the build-up, so you do get a bit more uh, regular thunderstorm activity. And then from November right through to April, this is our tropical cyclone, uh, tropical low season. So these are the kind of um, <coughs> months that you can expect a tropical cyclone in our, in our areas uh, of the top end. Uh, typically around BNT, uh, 
it's mostly uh, late December, early January, where we start seeing those first few tropical lows develop and possibly a tropical cyclone. So what does this look like? A build-up thunderstorm, as you can see, if you've looked at the radar today, it pops up, a few scans later, it starts decaying and then disappears. That's because the atmosphere doesn't quite have enough moisture to keep that storm going. It starts to suck in dry air, it starts to collapse on itself and dies out pretty quickly. Moving into the monsoon, as you can see, the, the whole radar starts to get covered with rainfall. And you get these bands also of thunderstorms that can occur and they can, they can sit over a location and just keep coming in. So those lines of convection can really add up to large amounts of rainfall, alternate conditions for a few hours, maybe even a day or so. And then monsoon will break conditions, as you can see, it looks pretty similar to the build-up thunderstorms, but the thunderstorms have a bit more energy, so they last a little bit longer. What are thunderstorms? Thunderstorms are pretty common up in the top end, as you can see. The average annual thunder days is pretty much the most in the country. We have about 80 right across the northwestern top end there. So uh, why do we have this? Basically, you need three ingredients for a thunderstorm to form. You need moisture, instability, and lift. So moisture, we have that right through the wet season. As, as most of you know, you work, walk outside, it's pretty humid. Instability is the, the rate where temperature rapidly decreases with height, and that gives the atmosphere the ability for convection to rise freely. A lifting mechanism can be some low-level convergence, atmospheric waves, such as a golf line moving across the top end, local effects, such as a sea breeze moving inland, converging with the air inland, and then triggering a storm from there. Or lifting ahead of a surge, so we get southeasterly surges pushing up from the base of the top end sometimes, and ahead of that surge, you get a convergence in the air that can trigger thunderstorms quite easily. So, thunderstorm timing. Overland, thunderstorms, as you're probably all aware, are most common in the afternoon. This is because the heat of the sun heats up the land and this gives it even more uh, lift. This gives it even more instability to then allow the thunderstorm to grow. Over maritime areas, thunderstorms are most common overnight. So this is due to the sea surface stays relatively the same throughout the day and the night. But what happens at night is the tops of the clouds start cooling off and this allows parcels of air from below to then access that energy to start lifting. What does a thunderstorm look like? A pulse thunderstorm, so what you kind of experience in the build-up. It starts off uh, as a cumulus, starts developing into a tearing cumulus. You get that convection coming up, it starts bubbling up. You're, most, you're mostly just getting updrafts at this stage. No precipitation quite yet. And then once, once the cloud develops enough, it starts precipitating, and this precipitation causes downdrafts. So in the mature stage, this is when the lightning activity is at highest, the wind shear, the turbulence, everything like that is at its peak. You've got the updrafts and the downdrafts in the storm. And then in a pulse thunderstorm, what happens is it starts choking itself, so it precipitates into the area where it's trying to suck air up, and it can't, it can't get any more... Uh, air to get sucked up, so it, it starts dissipating and you're just getting downdrafts at this point. So pulse thunderstorms can last from you know an hour to two hours or so, and then they start dying. A supercell thunderstorm is a little different in that it can continue for hours and hours on end. Uh, this is because it has this updraft that starts rotating and that, that rotation separates it from the downdraft so it's got its, it's got its updraft and the downdraft and it can move along with both of these happening at the same time so it, it's feeding itself and it's, and it's precipitating at the same time. So like I said, these thunderstorms can last quite a while and, and are much more hazardous um, as they can develop a lot stronger updrafts and downdrafts. Going on to hazards, some of these might be pretty obvious. There's quite a few hazards in a thunderstorm. Firstly, severe turbulence. 
You can get downdrafts of up to 6,000 feet per minute in a thunderstorm. Severe wind shear, so rapid changes in air speed and direction. As I showed you the diagram before, you've got the updrafts and downdrafts coinciding pretty closely to, to each other. So that, that creates a lot of wind shear in that area. Severe icing because you've got a lot of super cooled liquid water rising and it hasn't had quite enough time to cool off and form into ice yet. So low cloud and poor visibility are very common in thunderstorms, especially with heavy rainfall. There's a lot more moisture being precipitated underneath a thunderstorm. And obviously lightning is a no-brainer. It's, it's going to be there if it's a thunderstorm. Another hazard in thunderstorms uh, are microbursts. So what these are is it's a sudden burst of downward pushing air. So, so what happens, precipitation starts to fall below a thunderstorm and then it, it cools, it evaporates as it's dropping. And this evaporation cools the air below it and changes the density of the air. And as this happens, it, the air keeps accelerating and accelerating as the density increases. So then you get these these uh, sudden uh, bursts of uh, air movement coming down and then they hit the ground and start curling out and then you get these turbulent eddies forming uh, at, at, the, at the sides of the thunderstorm. So these, these are particularly hazardous uh, because not only do they cause uh, turbulence and wind shear, they can cause wind gusts, gusts in excess of 100 knots. So what they look like in um, underneath a thunderstorm, you've got uh, the precipitation falling here, and it's kind of clumped in like um, in a blob there. And then as it hits the ground, you can see it's spreading out rapidly and starting to curl out at the sides. Uh, why are these hazardous? Like I said, it's the really uh, strong wind gust you can get from them and the, the high wind shear. So in this example of the aircraft, encounters this pocket of high wind speeds from these downdraft coming outwards and then it gets into this area of, of the strong downdraft so then it's just all straight down on top of the aircraft coming through there then increases into this other area of high wind speed but in the opposite direction so there's quite a lot of wind shear and turbulence right throughout the whole the whole downdraft system how do you know that there is a microburst in the thunderstorm they're pretty hard to detect. Some things you can look for are so blowing dust because when you get that uh, winds, those winds coming down, they will force debris out quite quickly. As I said, they can ex exceed about 100 knots or so sometimes. Uh, Virga, so that's precipitation not reaching the ground. This is more common if the cloud base is quite high, so maybe further south in the territory. Precipitation, when you see that uh, precipitation hitting the ground and spreading outwards, you know there's a lot of energy forcing downwards and then getting pushed outwards, so that's a pretty good uh, indicator of a microburst in the area. And these two last points might be a bit obvious. If you're getting reports of wind shear, and unusual airspeed fluctuations, maybe you're in, uh, encountering a microburst. Another phenomena that we get from thunderstorms, it's kind of similar to microbursts, but it's, it's a bit more, uh, it's on a larger scale. So these are called gust fronts or outflow boundaries. Um, and what these are, they're, again, the air gets forced down in the thunderstorm and it creates the outflow but this outflow keeps going in the form of a gust front. And then this creates these, these pockets of severe turbulence forcing out from the thunderstorm. And these, I'll show you in a, in a second, these can create to act, act to create new thunderstorm cells. So on this radar example, you can see thunderstorms forming here. And we've got this gust front coming down here, triggering more thunderstorms and then another gust front coming through here. So what they look like on the ground or in the air if you're looking at them, sometimes you can see them in the form of these, these roll-like clouds coming out from pretty close to the base of the thunderstorm and they might come out and travel a lot further ahead of the thunderstorm. So that's a pretty common sign of the presence of a gust front. So moving on from thunderstorms, another hazard or 
a weather phenomena that creates a lot of hazards uh, is the monsoon. So the monsoon is where we get warm, moist, northwesterly flow from the maritime continent coming over the top end and converging on the monsoon trough and causing large-scale uplift to create a lot of rainfall, a lot of embedded thunderstorms, and from these, this also creates a lot of low cloud and reduced visibility in these conditions, which can last for a long time. Uh, you can also get quite strong wind gusts as the, the, um, the flow from the northwest can be quite vigorous at times. So tropical cyclones, I mean the definition of a tropical cyclone is when it gets many winds above 34 knots, so you know that it's going to have quite strong winds. Severe wind shear with those stronger winds. And this is, this is just within the actual um, uh, cyclone core, I guess you could call it. But outside of this, you're going to experience low cloud and rainfall with reduced visibility right around the system. And then you also get these embedded thunderstorm bands right, right around the uh, system, which can also converge and um, produce a lot of rainfall over one particular area. And, and these aren't just the hazard for aircraft in the air. You, well, I hope you won't be flying near one, but aircraft on the ground can have large impacts from tropical cyclones as well. So I want to just go through now products and services that we offer, what they look like in the wet season. If you've seen a graphical area forecast in the dry season, it looks nothing like this. Um, these are a little more complicated. So a tropical cyclone on a graphical area forecast, what we do is we, we put the position of the tropical cyclone and the movement of the tropical cyclone on the product to give you an idea of where the tropical cyclone is. And from there, you can actually go onto the public weather website and seek out more information about you know, watches and warnings and where that cyclone track, the, where the cyclone might move from the track map as well. Um, like I said before, widespread rainfall, showers, embedded thunderstorms are all quite common, severe turbulence, quite common around a thunderstorm and then around a tropical cyclone and then moving out from the cyclone you get slightly decreased uh, weather conditions. Uh, so an example from uh, a monsoon, so again we mark on the trough position, the monsoon trough position and around this uh, monsoon right up through the top end, uh, especially coastal areas, if you're experiencing widespread rainfall, embedded thunderstorms, showers, that kind of thing. So going back to thunderstorms, what do these look like in our forecast? Initially on the gaff, so thunderstorms would be included on the graphical area forecast if we think there is any chance of a thunderstorm forming, uh, be that isolated, occasional, frequent, embedded, um, if a thunderstorm occurs outside the area of us forecasting thunderstorms, we will put an airman out as soon as we uh, think there may be a chance of a thunderstorm forming or if a thunderstorm has already formed. On TAFs, if the chance of a thunderstorm is considered greater than or equal to about 30% at a location, we will put it on the TAF. So this isn't just we don't just send the TAF out and say, ah, oh, it'll be 30% for the rest of the day. We're, we're constantly monitoring that TAF, and as soon as we think there's, that chance has increased to above 30%, we're gonna amend the TAF. Be that, you know, a few hours before a storm might hit, or if it's a, a very unpredicted thunderstorm, maybe, you know, just before it hits kind of thing, but we're gonna be constantly monitoring it. It's not a kind of 30% chance for the day, set and forget kind of thing. What sort of things are you looking for that might give you a heads up that it's coming? Uh, where convection forms, so early cumulus development, uh, triggers, so sea breezes moving in, that kind of thing, uh, low level winds, which way the thunderstorms will move. There's, there's, <laughs> I could go on for days, but... <laughs> uh, so moving on, aerodrome warnings. So once a thunderstorm's developed, we send aerodrome warnings for Darwin, Tyndall and Alice Springs and we will send these an hour or two before the thunderstorm is expected to hit the, the aerodrome. So the Darwin TTF, this is just a, a quick heads up, so we issued the TTF between 20 Zulu and 1229 Zulu. 
Um, and this supersedes the TAF for its three hour validity. And any inconsistence, inconsistencies between the TTF and the TAF, uh, given that it supersedes it, will be limited to less than an hour. So if we think that inconsistency is going to be larger than an hour, we'll amend the TAF as well to reflect that. So what do thunderstorms look like on the TAF? Uh, a few examples. So if you're getting uh, strong winds in, in the line of thunderstorms, so 30 gusting 50 knots here, thunderstorms are likely to be severe and organised, meaning they're going to last for a lot longer than some kind of pulse thunderstorms. And obviously they're going to contain very strong winds. High bases on the uh, CB, so thunderstorms will be high base, obviously, um, and they mainly contain modest viz drops, so the, the rain, the precipitation may not even reach the ground, uh, but strong winds are very common because this can create microbursts here. Um, an inter, not a tempo, so thunderstorms can be pretty fast moving, and thunderstorms, as I mentioned, thunderstorms on the gaff, but not the taff, there's less than a 30% chance there. How do we forecast the weather? What do I do at work? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> I gather data. So we, we have to gather data. We have to gather observations, satellite, radar, weather balloons, weather stations, so automatic weather stations. We also get data from numerical weather predictions. So we run a lot of models, a lot of simulations that forecast uh, lots of different parameters. We get all this information and we analyze it. We use our scientific understanding, we use our training to then develop a, a policy on what's going to happen. We use our situational awareness and our, our knowledge of, of how many times we've seen this scenario happen in Darwin. Is this sea breeze going to kickstart a thunderstorm? That kind of thing. And then from here, we develop our forecasts. So we code them up in a specific way, tax, gas, that kind of thing. So a forecast isn't perfect. It's our best guess of what we think will happen based on our experience, our knowledge, all the input that we're getting. <coughs> so some uncertainty. Observations are, are a big one. There's, there are large distances between our surface network stations in the NT. Um, and these automatic observations can have errors in them. We like to detect them pretty quickly, but sometimes that can feed into other things. The computers, they can give us a pretty good idea of a large area of, you know, this area might have thunderstorms kind of thing. It's up to us to then drill down into the detail and say, is Darwin going to get a thunderstorm? Are the Tiwi Islands going to get a thunderstorm? Of course, they get one every day. <laughs> this is only as good as the initial conditions. So if you're feeding bad observations into the NWP, it's going to give you bad results. And it's our risk assessment. So what, what, what we use um, is our knowledge, our experience from similar weather events to say, yeah, this is, this is a 40 to 50% chance of happening for Darwin today. Therefore, we need to put this on the forecast nice and early and go from there. And then, you know, as, as each issue of the TAF comes, we'll slightly <laughs> tweak that forecast to best reflect the latest information. And it's the tropics. So this is a huge source of uncertainty. Um, the weather is chaotic. There are a lot of subtle variations. So a, a sea breeze of 12 knots versus 14 knots might mean the difference of thunderstorms or no thunderstorms in Darwin. And there are limits to the products we issue. So we know a lot more about the weather than what we can write in a TAF or a GAF. So we have limits of the product as well. So the timing of thunderstorms has a lot of uncertainty. So there's a few factors here. So if we have thunderstorm activity overnight or yesterday, the thunderstorms can be quite often delayed. Large amounts of instability in the atmosphere, this can act to trigger thunderstorms pretty quickly. So sometimes we may not be able to keep up with that development of the thunderstorms if it's a little bit quicker than what we expected. Um, the moisture levels in the low, low levels of the atmosphere can have a big impact on the development of thunderstorms also. And the location, like I said, we can, we can say over a large area, yeah, there'll be thunderstorms here, but in terms of the actual location a thunderstorm will form, it's quite hard to pick. So like I said, it's subtle small scale features 
that can act as a third trigger here. Um, I've covered a lot of information today. If you want more information, our website contains a lot of knowledge. We've got this thing called the Knowledge Center. Down, if you go to our homepage, scroll down, click on Aviation Weather Services, hit this button on the side called the Knowledge Center, and it has a lot of information about all our products, uh, different weather phenomena such as thunderstorms, uh, monsoons, that kind of thing. So if you want more information, have a look at our website. And if you're unsure of the forecast, you're looking at the product and you're saying, what's going on? Why is this on the forecast? I don't believe them. Give us a call. <laughs> we'll discuss it. <laughs> so if you want that number, it's on, it's on the bottom of all our graphical area forecasts. And also, if you're flying somewhere and you see something that isn't on the forecast, give us a call and let us know. We need that feedback. Like I said, we have limitations, and some of the limitations are our observations. So if we don't know it's happening, we can't forecast it very well. So that's all I've got time for. Um, thanks. No, good on you, mate. I just want to quickly introduce our, our second speaker, um, Bob uh, Callaby. Bob is the Aerodrome Safety and Standards Manager here at Darwin International Airport. Bob just wants to have a, a, a quick chat to you for about five minutes or so, specifically on the subject of cyclone safety around the airport, things like tying down aircraft, securing ground support equipment, loose articles and that type of thing. So uh, without any further ado, please welcome Bob Callaway. Thanks Tim, good evening ladies and gentlemen. And he said it all already, I just wanted to give you that message. Please tie down your aeroplanes, <laughs> clean up your premises, stow any loose materials and, and uh, ground service equipment. But I'll just show you a few slides from Cyclone Marcus, which most of us experienced on the 17th of March this year. That's my street, uh, and that was the scene all over Darwin. Also on Darwin Aerodrome, we had uh, 500 trees down on the aerodrome itself. That's my driveway. That was a great coconut tree. <laughs> the uh, toll freight 737-400 parked on May 25. It's parked there every weekend, as it was. Uh, Cyclone Marcus was a Saturday. I know one of the captains who lives in Brisbane, he called me about nine o'clock that Saturday morning when uh, this cyclone was brewing. And of course, we do have a cyclone plan and we had made preparations, but uh, he calls me and he says, I'm just watching the nine news. He said, I'm a bit worried about that aeroplane up there. He said, it's, it's not much fuel on it. And I don't know if there's any ballast. And uh, we had a discussion and I said, uh, Oh, I should be right, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Weighs 40 tonnes, empty. All right, I'll tell you where Bob Callaby said it should be right. And uh, you can see there it's spun through 180 degrees. Uh, it had the tail prop in place. Uh, we think that it, it sat on the tail prop and jumped its chocks and then rolled forward. But um, the, the gusts uh, from Michael, uh, Marcus uh, Harry, 130 kilometres on airport. And uh, at that time when that was occurring, we've got some CCT vision of that, as we do uh, over the entire aerodrome, so we don't miss too much. <laughs> we saw a number of individuals in the Northern GA uh, attempting to tie down aircraft in 130 kilometre limits. So we don't want to see a repetition of that. So I say again, message is get your aeroplanes tied down early. Uh, the Fokker didn't move. I think the 737's got a big vertical fin and, and the winds were from the east, Harry, in Marcus. And, uh, yeah, pushed it around from the east. Now you can see it spun around. You can see the nose wheel is on a 90 degree angle. Um, there are engineers based in Darwin with their work and they assessed and tested the aeroplane and it was fine, fortunately, and uh, my mate Bruce flew it out on the Monday. There's some of the other damage we saw on airport, the, the shade sails over the taxi rank. Uh, our, our bowsers, just air side of the tower, lost all their covers. Uh, the Aviation Institute, which was nestled amongst those big, beautiful African mahoganies, is now denuded. We just have to give, give it a coat of paint because it, it stands out. But all those trees came down. Uh, just some of the clean-up around the, the Aviation Institute. This aeroplane, 
146 freighter was at um, Pearl Flight Centre. It was 180 degrees different to where it is there now. And you can see it's also rolled off the apron. Similar effect from the wind. Now, airline aircraft wouldn't normally be here. And uh, air work, I don't think, uh, if there's a cyclone looming, they would leave the aeroplane here. That one unfortunately got clipped by another aircraft about a week before that and required some repairs, so that shouldn't have been here either. The message is please tie down your aeroplanes, we'll get out some information to you. Hey Bob, can you explain to these guys the um, thunderstorm alert that goes off in the civil terminal and how that ground crew don't come out so that we can't taxi guys in and out, they'll sit there and block it up a bit? Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a warning system, it's actually owned by Qantas, it's not DIA's. And you'll see the five and ten nautical mile um, warning lights it's at the RPT apron. I think the GA refueler has a version. Um, and there's a ten nautical mile uh, warning at the five, the ground crew abandoned ship. They won't service the aircraft. Although Qantas now have a procedure where they can set up the nosing guidance so at least they can park the aeroplane. But uh, yeah, as I say, it's. Um, it's owned by Qantas primarily for their benefit. We, um, we issue the information as an advisory only. So guys, the brief tonight is going to be about the wet season from an ATC context. It's, going to be, uh, it's not going to be like a lecture. It's going to be a bit of a practical brief. I'm going to be telling you how we see things, what we can and can't do for you. And hopefully you can take at least something away tonight to actually use during the wet season. Who's here in their first wet season? Pilots? A handful? <laughs> And going into your second wet season? Yeah, so a pretty good number as well. So hopefully, this is all aimed at you guys. It's not really aimed at anyone else. It's aimed at the pilots. Hopefully you can take something away from it to actually use in your planning. So the scope tonight, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about control of workload. I'll go into what we can do for you, and then I'll go into what we can't do. Knowing what we can't do is just as important as knowing what we can do. It's all part of that expectation management. When you're flying into Darwin, you need to have the right expectation of how we can help you and how we can't help you. I'll talk a little bit about our limitations, specifically in Darwin, whether it's equipment or our actual facilities here. And finally, I'll cover off with a little bit of um, so basically pointers for you guys to improve your own safety and to help efficiency uh, for everyone else, other pilots and for ATC. So control of workload. During the dry season, if you're 100 miles away and I tell you to track direct to Darwin, I'm about 99.9% .9 sure you can do it. It doesn't matter where you are, if I give you a vector, I know you can fly the vector, I know there's gonna be no weather. It's pretty easy controlling, it's busy, but it's not particularly complex. We don't have much terrain, and when you take weather out of it, it's just busy, pure ATC. The wet season changes all that. When we have a nice big thunderstorm straight in the control area somewhere, or even on the zone, all of that simplicity goes, and it immediately becomes more complex. So eight aircraft during the dry season could be quite busy. Those same eight aircraft during the wet season can become incredibly complex and very, very difficult to control. So what does that mean for you? It means that the human being sit, uh, sitting in that console speaking to you during the wet season, during a storm, they're much more busy than they would be in the dry. So uh, we may be slower to issue instructions. We may not be able to give you what you asked for. Uh, so it's important to remember that that controller sitting there, they're a lot busier than they usually are. And the pressure on them is exactly the same as the pressure on you. We all want to do well, we all want to be safe, but it's much harder in the wet for us and for you. So moving on to what we can do for you. So ATC can provide you with up-to-date weather in Darwin itself. Uh, the control tower are all qualified observers. We can tell you exactly what we can see. The weather radar we use, I'll touch on it later, but um, it's not particularly useful from an approach perspective. But certainly looking out the windows, we can tell you exactly what we can see. That'll at least give you our idea of the control zone and the immediate surrounding areas. Uh, advisor proceeding right reports, so we can just simply ask the aircraft, what are the conditions like on final? What are the conditions like at lead point? What are they like at Channel Island? We can just ask people to tell us because they're the ones who are gonna have the best idea not us. And then of course we can relay that information to you. Uh, holding instructions, so when there is uh, weather directly overhead the field and visual approaches uh, are not actually possible at all, we can give you instructions to hold somewhere. We do like to use those big cardinal points around the zone, Hope Inlet, Lee Point, Wicker Point, Channel Island. They're really easy to spot for you guys and they're pretty close to, uh, to base points for us. So it's nice to be able to keep you there. You're only about two minutes away from base if we put you there. Uh, another thing to note, if we do put you there with other aircraft, regardless of whether you're VFR or being separated, we're not going to hold you at the same level as someone else. If I've got someone at 1,000 feet at lead point, I'm not going to put you there as well. I'm going to at least segregate you. 
So we're not going to stitch you up like that, particularly with bad weather. <laughs> <laughs> we're not required to separate, but we do, we do still have that duty of care there. Estimated holding duration, uh, the important word there is estimated. Uh, the weather in Darwin is predictably unpredictable. Um, we're not that good. We can't, uh, we can't tell you when a storm is going to end. We can look at trends, we can look at directions, but there might be another storm directly behind another one, or it may just present itself over the field. So we can only ever give you an estimate. And finally, assistance with diversion. So we can conduct uh, coordination with Brisbane. We can find out what the weather is like at places like MKT, Delisable, up at the TV Islands. If it's bad in Darwin, it's probably worse at the TV Islands. But um, yeah, we, we can at least assist you with uh, a navigation service if you do make that decision to divert. Once again, these are just as important as what we can do. Uh, the first one is pretty important. A lot of these roll into each other, but the first one's important. We can't preempt what you want. Uh, the only way for us to know what you need and what you want is for you to tell us. Uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the underlying theme of my entire brief. You've got to be able to tell us accurately and early what you need in order to fly your aircraft safely. We can't provide you accurate weather updates for the entirety of our control, uh, area space. The reality is that we're using that bomb rain radar. It can have up to a 10 minute delay. So the information we're giving you can be up to 10 minutes late. In terms of track miles, 10 minutes is a long time. That's a difference between being at 30 miles and being close to final. So just be aware that the information we're giving you is all we can see on radar and it may be late. So the best judge of that weather directly in front of you is always going to be you. Uh, ATC cannot always give you proactive weather deviations. It's pretty similar to the first point there. We can't tell you whether diverting left or right is going to be best for you. Um, just because the first two aircraft in front of you over the last 10 minutes uh, diverted left, maybe that's not going to be best for you. Maybe it's clear and you don't need to divert. Maybe you need to divert right, maybe you need to descend. Uh, we don't know. All we can do is give you what you ask for. That's a very, very important point I'm going to try to hammer home. Uh, fourth one, I'm sure you're all pretty aware of this as well. We can't give you what you want all the time. Um, Every single aircraft we control is not in isolation. We have to control every aircraft in the context of not only their processing, but every aircraft around them as well. You may be one of maybe 10 aircraft inside 30, 30 nautical miles of Darwin, and they all want the same thing. They all want to land or depart. So it's a matter of prioritization for us. Sometimes we can't give you what you want. Uh, it might, might come down to a bit of negotiation. I may offer you something else, but I can't give you exactly what you want. Uh, fifth one, this is a fairly important one as well. Special VFR, now our pilot SMEs are going to touch on Special VFR, but from an ATC context, don't use Special VFR as a get out of jail free card or a planning tool. Don't sit down in your pre-briefing during marginal weather and say, oh that's okay, I can just ask for Special VFR, because it's not something you can bank on. Uh, our requirements for Special VFR clearances are fairly straightforward. If your Special VFR clearance is going to delay an IFR aircraft, we just won't give it to you. We're just going to have to divert you or hold you or keep you low in order to process you. So that special VFR clearance shouldn't be used as a way to uh, basically get around good planning. And uh, finally, much, uh, much like that first uh, point there, exact holding duration, we can't do it for you. Uh, during the weather, it's, it's unpredictable. We'll give you holding. We may be able to give you an estimate, but it's not going to be exact. So some of the limitations here in Darwin itself, uh, the visual appreciation we can give you from tower, if there's a cell directly overhead the field, and we've got about a thousand metres of ease, any appreciation we give you is not going to be particularly useful. We can tell you that the, the weather at the field is bad, and that's about it. We, <laughs> you can't see, if I can't even see the runway, I'm not going to be able to help you out about the point. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. So um, I can look at the radar once again, but uh, six, seven minutes delay uh, on the radar could be, could be the difference between lead point being perfectly fine for holding and lead point being a, a, a big mess. So, just be aware of that as well. If we tell you there's weather at the field, we probably can't see a whole lot. Uh, separation, unfortunately, our separation requirements don't change with the weather. We always require the same form of separation. You're going to be most acutely aware of this in those big departure waves. I'm sure you've sat at the holding point in some of those wet season days with three aircraft in front and three aircraft behind you wondering uh, what the delay is. A big part of those departure waves for tower is visual separation. We use visual separation to get you off the runway and that becomes another form of separation once you go to approach, usually radar or vertical. It doesn't matter if the aircraft in front is a Conquest and you're a Cessna 210. It doesn't matter if there's no chance in hell that you can catch that aircraft. The moment you're both airborne, we have to be separating you. And if we can't see one of you, unfortunately we can't separate. So it's another thing we have to stress to our controls as well. In those wet season departure pushes, everything just slows down. And it's unfortunate for you guys sitting in the aircraft, but 
That's unfortunately what we require. So it requires patience from the controllers to just slow themselves down and even more patience from yourselves. Some of the rapid changes that can happen to the airfield itself and our uh, configuration, we can rapidly go from visual approaches to instrument approaches. Uh, generally speaking, we'll try to preempt this. If we know where this is coming, we'll preempt with our EIA on the ATIS. Sometimes it's not possible, sometimes it sneaks up on us, but we'll try as, as best as we can to give you that, uh, that preempted EIA when, uh, when weather is moving in. Availability of runways. Uh, I'm sure you've seen runway 36 uh, not available many times during the wet. Uh, once the crosswind gets to that 20 knot point, we just have to knock it on the head, especially if it's wet. Uh, this moves into the bottom one as well, Lazo. You may have found yourself holding a wicked point. Your Lazo approved. Why can't ATC just shoot me into 36? Lazo is a procedure that's under pretty heavy scrutiny, and we have very specific uh, criteria we have to meet. A lot of those criteria are about weather. So as soon as those weather conditions, uh, the cloud and the visibility get to a point where we can't use it, we just have to stop using it. As soon as we stop using it, that means delays. It means we can't put you on the runway at the same time as another aircraft to 29. It just means delays. This is just a, a cover off of the brief itself. This is a few things that I've put in uh, what you as pilots can do for yourselves, for me, uh, for me as a controller, and also other pilots. Pre-briefing and flight planning. So I, I can only imagine how much more complex planning your flight is during the wet season compared to the dry. I'm not going to stand here and try to give you a lesson on it. I obviously don't know, but I can only imagine that it's more complex. Um, the SMEs are obviously the ones who are uh, going to touch on that. The second point there is another highlight of the major point of the brief. Request deviations early. Tell us as soon as you can what you need and when you need it. Uh, if you're finding yourself imminently about to fly into cloud or about to fly into weather and you haven't told us what the situation is, you've waited far too long. You need to be able to tell us. If we can't give you something, we'll tell you, but you have to ask the question. You have to tell us what you require. Uh, the next two points are exactly the same thing. So be accurate with what you want. Be succinct. Uh, don't um and after 30 seconds and, and block up the airways. Be succinct. Know what you want before you push that button and tell us what you need. If it's something that you need, use the word require. If you say the word require, that's a catchword for us. We know you need it. So there's a much greater chance we're going to do our best to give it to you. We may not be able to, it may be a negotiation process, we may have to offer you something else, but use the word require when you do require something. And once again, plan for those alternate options early. The, the last two are pretty much the same as well. You, need, you obviously know that diverts, diversions and weather deviations and holding are far more likely during the wet, so your planning needs to reflect that, uh, particularly with fuel, which Eris and will touch on as well. That's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. A number of years ago now, quite a few years ago now, um, the University of Illinois in the United States, they, they, they did a research project where they had 20 pilots as guinea pigs. These 20 pilots were VFR only pilots. They put these pilots in a, in a flight simulator and they had the flight simulator flying in cloud or simulated cloud conditions. And they said to each of these 20 guinea pig pilots, just try and keep the aircraft straight and level for me. It took anywhere from 480 seconds to only 20 seconds for these pilots to lose control of that aircraft and enter an in-flight loss of control situation. But the average amount of time it took was 178 seconds. So I thought it worthwhile tonight to play this video. It's an oldie but a goodie, but it certainly drives home a good message. The sky is overcast and the visibility poor. That reported eight kilometer visibility looks more like three and you can't judge the height of the cloud. Your altimeter says you're at 1,500 feet, but your map tells you there's local terrain as high as 1,200 feet. There might even be a tower nearby because you're not sure just how far off course you are. But you've flown into worse weather than this, so you press on. You find yourself unconsciously easing back just a bit on the controls to clear those non too imaginary towers. With no warning, you're in the soup. You peer so hard into the milky white mist that your eyes hurt. You fight the feeling in your stomach. You swallow, only to find your mouth dry. Now you realize you should have waited for better weather. The meeting was important but not that important. Somewhere a voice is saying, you should have turned back. 
You now have 178 seconds to live. Your aircraft feels on an even keel, but your compass turns slowly. You push your rudder pedal and add pressure to the controls to stop the turn, but this feels unnatural, so you quickly return the controls to their original position. That feels better, but now your compass is turning a little faster and your airspeed is increasing slightly. You scan your instrument panel for help, but you don't find any. It all looks unfamiliar. You're sure this is just a bad spot. You'll break out in a few minutes. But you don't have a few minutes. You now have 100 seconds to live. You glance at your altimeter and are shocked to see it unwinding. You're already down to 1,200 feet. Instinctively, you pull back on the controls, but the altimeter still unwinds. The engine is into the red, and the airspeed's almost there too. You have 45 seconds to live. Now you're sweating and shaking. There must be something wrong with the controls. Pulling back only moves that airspeed indicator deep into the red. You can hear the wind tearing at the aircraft. You have 10 seconds to live. Suddenly, you see the ground. The trees rush up at you. You can see the horizon if you turn your head far enough, but it's at an unusual angle. You're almost inverted. You open your mouth to scream. Unfortunately, we're still losing pilots to this type of thing, not only in the top end and in the northern parts of Australia, but also in the southern parts of Australia. They're not, they're not just raw statistics, they're real people and it's, you know, it's a tragedy. So sometimes you feel like we have to keep, you know, repainting the Sydney Harbour Bridge and going back and revisiting this stuff. But I think it's an important message that um, a night like tonight, I think it's, it's an important take home message. VFR flight into cloud is, um, is uh, not, a, not a good thing. In-flight loss of control, if you're gonna have an accident, in-flight loss of control is not the type of accident to have. The odds aren't good. Thanks for that. What we're going to do now is enter that part of our night where we hear from our subject matter experts. These are people with significant operational experience, many wet seasons under their belt, some good stories to tell, and some good information to pass across. So the first person that we'd like to hear from is a gentleman by the name of Greg Imlay. Greg is currently a flying operations inspector here at the CASA Darwin office. As you can see from the screen, he learned to fly quite a few years ago now, back in 1974. He's been the chief pilot of two Darwin organisations and he's been with CASA about nine years in this role as flying operations inspector. Significant wet season experience, both here in the top end and also in Southeast Asia with um, about 12 and a half thousand hours. So without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Greg Inlay, please. They told me to bring two hats tonight and I've got them here. Uh, this is one from Sea Air Pacific where I did my float plane running, which was a ton of fun. And this is my CASA one. So the first bit I'm going to be talking to is going to have the sea in one. Well, I'm not going to wear it, that's who I am at the moment. I'm an industry person. We've moved on from the part of the evening where we were talking about um, concrete things, I suppose, air traffic control and um, MET and the airport, things flying around the airport. We're now moving into the area of where we're going to be delving into human factors issues. It's a sad fact that, as Tim alluded to, a loss of control entry uh, or an entry into uh, IMC via VFR pilot and the subsequent loss of control is nearly always a fatal event, often a fatal event. They still continue to occur and we still keep trying to do something about it, but it's a difficult subject to get hold of because it's a human factors issue. Those human factors are difficult to nail down and difficult to do things about. We're here tonight because we're having a go and because we're going to keep having a go at doing something about these human factors. 
The aviation landscape is fairly different to when I learned to fly and became a commercial pilot. It's become clear to everyone that there are really not many old and bold mentors around in the GA industry anymore. The airlines have sucked away all those experienced people. When I learned to fly in 74, there were 10 instructors at the school. The lowest experienced one had 1,000 hours, and the boss had about 15,000 hours. The guy who taught me to fly and sent me to solo had 10,000 hours. Those sorts of people just aren't around anymore in the training industry. And unfortunately, they're often not around in small GA organisations. So that valuable mentoring that was available then isn't readily available now. That's just a fact of life and there's not much we can do about it. Like I say to plenty of people, if it was possible for us to develop a vaccine or a, a drug or a, some sort of implant that we could give all that accumulated experience of everyone in the aviation industry and just inject it into them, and they will all have it from day one, we would solve a whole lot of this human factor stuff. But that's just not going to happen whilst we have aircraft with crew on them. So experience levels are down across the board. Mentors aren't readily available. But unfortunately, experience is sometimes the only way to get a handle on some things. You've got to actually have to experience it to determine whether it's whether you can do it, how, how dangerous it might be, and what you could do about avoiding getting into trouble with it. But we can't just go and send you off and fly in the clouds to find out how bad they are. It just doesn't work like that. We can't have people continuing to push the boundary to get closer and closer to an event. That's just not going to work. So what we're going to try and do is just instill a little snippet of something from this type of forum, which you may be able to take away with you. Peter and the team are going to work on a toolkit which is going to look at the hazards that we've identified. And what we're going to try and do against those hazards is when we eventually send this out to you or deliver a product to you, is to give you some strategies on how you might address those hazards and stop them becoming a real risk. Because while they're on the board and sitting up there, there's still a hazard like the hole in the runway. I don't become a risk until you actually interact with it. Now, I was asked to uh, talk about something that happened in my past um, in order to give you the I learned something from that lecture. Not really a lecture, but it's not really clear whether I learned something from that at the time or not. But looking back a long time ago, I will just go through what happened and let you think for yourself about what the risks, what the hazards were, and, well, you'll see for yourself. The reason we look back at stuff is that. There's been a few paraphrases of that. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. <coughs> More simply put, learn from the mistakes. Because if we don't know those mistakes, we might make the same one. So one way for our industry is to be informed of history that's important to us as pilots. Unfortunately, the place you find that is accident reports. Even if you read every one there was, you wouldn't have the full picture. But if you did read every one that was out there, particularly in Australia, maybe in the not top end, or even if you drilled down to just weather-related accidents, there's an astonishing number of them. And they've got depressingly similar things in them. And we'll get to that at the end of my talk. So this is a repainted version of the aircraft involved. So the time is 1980. It was my second flying job. I uh, learned to fly at Bankstown. I did an instructor's rating after my commercial. And I did a bit of instructing with the company that uh, gave me my training. And then I got a job at Maruya. Maruya is on the south coast of New South Wales, a beautiful seaside town. I hadn't had much charter experience, probably 20 hours maybe. 
At the time of this incident in this particular aircraft, I had 480 hours, about 150 instructing and about 50 charter. I didn't have an instrument rating. But let me tell you, I knew everything. <laughs> I was shit hot. <laughs> right? I was hired by the Aero Club and I was the only pilot in town with a commercial licence. There were a couple of pilots. So I was the one they looked at. Those years we had this, this aeroplane was built in about 1979, so it was only a year old, beautiful. It was a different colour, but it had, everything was nice, like the plastic on the seats. And I loved flying it. So I was the one to do a charter. So the job was from Maria over to Chum. Now, those of you who know that country, Chum is in the Snowy Mountains. Uh, it's over the other side of the Great Dividing Range, but it's only 100 miles from uh, Maria, so it's not a real big deal. The people who wanted to go there were some high-powered locals. I can't recall what they were in, but they might have been real estate people or stock and station people, something like that. But they wanted to go there, they were paying a fair bit of money to do it, I had to take them there. I don't recall the forecast, it was probably alright, but the fact that I don't recall it probably means I didn't pay much attention to it. However, one of the client's friends said, oh yeah, the weather's fine at Chum, no problem. So I'm not good to go. So being a good charter pilot, um, Wanting to save money, I just drew a line from Maria. This is a new chart, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Not the chart at the time. Uh, off I was running. So this is the this is the line I drew on the map. And you'll see that there's a bit of terrain here, and a bit of terrain here. This is Canberra here, and there's the there's the destination. What could go wrong with that? Looks like that's not straight on. So. The day came, we took off, climbed up, the Cessna 206 climbed pretty well, so I'm heading off in the direction of Chumon. I knew the area reasonably well, I'd flown around it a bit, been there a couple of months, like four months or something. Um, so I'm flying out there and there's some cloud. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, it's on the coast, there's always going to be a bit of cloud. So inevitably, as I got closer to the hills and climbed higher, the cloud started to come out a little bit, or I suppose I got closer to the cloud. I need to set the scene for 1980. In 1980, people, VFR pilots going into controlled airspace was not routine. There was some sort of a, a mindset that we didn't call ATC to get a clearance. There was some sort of mindset that the controlled airspace was reserved for IFR jets. So, in the back of your mind, oh, well, we, don't, we really avoid controlled airspace, so I never considered going direct to Canberra, for instance, and then going over there. I just said, no, no, I'll we'll give that a miss, and I'll just skirt around the edge of the controller. So I climbed up to a height that would keep me clear of the ground, I thought, but the clouds started to get thicker. I did some sort of left and right weaving here to stay in some low country, but the cloud was still getting thicker, but I, I kept going. I could deal with it. I was the gun pilot from Maria. I'm, I've got no problems. So I found myself flying up a valley, somewhere around here, and the cloud got thicker and thicker and the vis was poor, there was a bit of rain. I thought, oh well, I knew where I'm going. Over the other side of these hills here is this low country, so all I've got to do is get past this little bit and all will be well. However then, of course, the inevitable happened, <coughs> and that visibility turned into cloud, straight in. It's hard to recall what I did then, but what I do believe I did, I just froze. I sat there. Fortunately, when I sat there and froze, I was looking at the attitude of the camera. That previous uh, the, uh, video, showed the person looking outside. If I was looking outside, I would likely to have been like that. If for some reason, I was looking at the attitude indicator. And I kept looking at that attitude indicator. I, I presume any of you who have been in a stressful situation realise that your vision narrows. 
you get tunnel vision, you only see something straight in front of you. You don't know what's going on there. The passengers could have been screaming, they could have been doing anything. Don't know. All I could see was the attitude indicator. And all I did was keep that attitude indicator level. I knew how to fly instruments, I had a little bit of instrument time. I had a bit of instructing under my belt too. It took about a minute. I thought I stayed level. Turned out I didn't. But in about one minute, I popped out and I'm out here. I more than likely clicked the edge of that control zone. And as it turns out later, I wasn't exactly where I was. Well, one of the things that struck me and has struck me in later years, I've never really had any conscious thought processes. I don't recall ever thinking about turning back. I don't even recall thinking about climbing up in the cloud or climbing above it and asking for clearance. I don't believe any of those things cross my mind. After I ended in the cloud, all rational decision making went out the window. I was a passenger. I was trapped looking at the attitude in the car. So if you think about what the accident report might have read, if we'd have smacked into the hill or lost control, it would have said what it usually says. The aircraft was probably serviceable. It had sufficient fuel for the flight. The pilot was licensed and had a proper medical. The aircraft was loaded to within its weight and balance limitation. The aircraft was equipped for VFR flight. The pilot did not have an instrument on The pilot planned a straight line across very high country without even thinking about going another way. The forecast indicated that VFR flight was possible, but there were problems with cloud. And the end of the accident report in those days would have read something like, the reasons for the poor decision making of the pilot not turning around or avoiding the weather could not be determined. And that used to appear on just about every weather related accident report, and it still does. It turned out that I wasn't quite where I thought I was. When I came back that afternoon, it was nice and shiny. I realised that I was over here somewhere. And I was at about 5,000. 500 feet on a VFR altimeter in a Cessna 206 in the cloud. Who knows how close we come? So what did I learn? Well, on that day I didn't learn anything. I landed at Tunic, I went and did their business. The weather improved, got back in the plane, flew home. I didn't talk to anyone about it. Didn't have a partner. Had a few friends, had a beer at the pub, but didn't talk to them about this, couldn't talk to them about that. Didn't have another pilot and person there to talk to. Being a young gun pilot, self introspection isn't my strong suit when, in 1980. I'm probably not much better now, but then. I was hopeless. I just saw the world as a big, bright, shiny ball and I was flying around and having fun. It wasn't, did I do something wrong? Did I make a decision or did I not make a decision? Did I expose people to dying or anything like that? That didn't cross my mind. And even so, that sort of thing is quite difficult to share and quite individual. And it's not until you mature a bit do you realise that you can talk about that and express it and perhaps get something out of it. So what can we do? We've got to find a way that these sorts of experiences, which almost wrote myself and four people off, don't get learned by bitter experience. It's like the cliff diving thing. I'll keep diving a bit higher off the cliff until I really break something. We can't keep doing it. So what we've got to do, if we can't develop that vaccine, stop people going into these sorts of situations, we've got to develop some strategies. We can help, but as you can see from this scenario, a lot of it is entirely personal. 
you're the one making the decisions or not. In this case, I didn't make many at all. I just kept going. That was really simple. Turning around and going back might have been a bit harder. So what I'm putting out to you there is, this accident would have been a purely human factors accident. It would have been depressingly the same as other accidents. It wouldn't have been any different to all those other hundreds that are out there. It didn't happen to me at 500 hours. I got through it. But we can't discount the possibility that someone in this room might find themselves in this same situation again in the future. <coughs> now, these forums are one way of getting this information across in a way where we can openly talk about it. And if you can openly talk about it, someone else can learn from it. Um, I'd like you to welcome Cameron Marchant, currently Head of Operations at Fly Standards here in Darwin, learned to fly back in Brisbane. He's had numerous jobs across the top end with everyone from Vincent Aviation, Sky Trans, was Chief Pilot at Chart Air. Qualified flying instructor with the Army on helicopters of one aviation regiment. Currently does also check and training roles with Air North and is currently also a flight examiner. Everyone, will you please welcome Cameron March. There's a lot of wisdom that can probably be dragged out of dead guy quotes. Greg's giving you a good dead guy quote tonight. Uh, those who don't learn from history <laughs> lessons are doomed to repeat them. These are the lessons that other people have paid for. They've bought them and that's on your behalf. So Greg's case study there, and I think we'll all agree that with his near miss, he was probably one of the lucky ones. Many are not so lucky. It's really, really important you do read and learn and analyse not only the other experiences that others have, but also the ones that you'll have on a day-to-day -day basis. Those of you who know me well um, know that I expound the virtues of uh, self-analysis. In reviewing every flight that you do, whether or not it goes well or not so well, to pull out the little gems of knowledge or the little treasures that you can put away for future reference. If it's true to say that we all start our flying careers, and most of this is directed at pilots, of course, if we all start our flying careers with two bags, one of them's an empty bag, that's the bag of experience. And the other one is a full bag, and that's the bag of luck. All right, it's true to say that our aim as pilots particularly in the early phases of our careers, is to fill the bag of experience as best we can so that we can refine our judgment and our techniques, preferably before we empty the bag of luck, the depth of which we don't know. So what I want to do tonight with my discussion is to help, is to not really discuss how innovatively over the years I've tried to empty my bag of luck, which still has something in it, hope. But what I want to talk about is maybe giving some tools. The aim of tonight is a toolkit. So prior to uh, Peter and the team releasing the toolkit that they've formally put through, I thought I'd just run through some concepts and maybe offer some tools that hopefully you'll be able to gain something from. I have one slide. You can work through it with me. And it outlines the template of what I want to speak to. The first one... And if you have a look at everything that's been said tonight, the aim of tonight or the focus of tonight is wet season weather, weather in general, weather related bad things happening to aircraft. However, when I sit down and look at this, it's not just weather. It's always weather and something else. Swiss cheese model, we've all read it in the books, about multiple things lining up to cause the bad outcome. If it was just weather, you damn straight would never fly into it. It's always weather and something else. And it's that something else that I think actually is part of what we need to analyse. In Greg's case tonight, I'll put it out there, who wants to hazard a guess or an answer to what was the something else? ATC. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plan that. <laughs> Sorry, Rich, you're taking it. <laughs> All 
All right, um, who can help him out? Maybe leave, maybe leave Richard. Complacency. Complacency? All right, who would agree that Greg was complacent? Okay, cool. It's rat on Greg Day, if you like. Greg's All right. Man. Yep, absolutely. What else? Possibly ego. Possibly ego. Everyone's bashing around human factors here. That's great. That's definitely something in our industry these days. Something else. Take another dimension. Commercial pressure is a big one. What? There are four, four guys? Meeting? Got to happen? All, right. All the commercial pilots, charter pilots in the room are aware of commercial pressure. It will cause you to make decisions that are not necessarily considerate of risk. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm a simple guy. To me, the number one thing there in Greg's situation is weather and terrain. I've spent wet seasons flying around North Queensland, Papua New Guinea, East Timor. All right, terrain, terrain, terrain. All right, as the clouds get lower, the ground gets higher. It's always that way. Right, it's always weather and something else. It might just be one thing, it might be two, it might be three. Just take just five seconds, just have a think about what a something else might be that hasn't been raised so far. Roland, what do you reckon? Uh, get the blank at the moment. Oh, inexperience. Inexperience, definitely. It's very, very, very hard to analyse something that you don't really have a level of technical knowledge about or have seen before. What about another one? A way out, plan B. Okay, not having options. So that's a decision-making process. Structures, Greg's already mentioned that, which is great. One last one. self sir, in the white shirt. Um, poor planning. Okay, poor planning. Oh, always something else. I could rattle off a whole lot. Weather and the aircraft, a VFR aircraft with dodgy instruments. Weather and night time. How do you see thunderstorms at night? You actually don't until they start taking pictures. All right, when the paparazzi come out, they take pictures. That's where you see them, but they're hard to identify. And one of my sort of personal nilly wooksy moments was thunderstorms and night. I'm sure you can draw the lines. Right, so weather and something, it's always that something else that causes you to make a decision that's not necessarily considered of risk. The big ones in the Northern Territory tend to be commercial pressure, complacency. Greg was shit hot, all right? He's not alone in the room. Um, so something to bear in mind. Some specific pressure points that I want to raise. The first one, where the weather actually starts to impact on us. All right, the weather and something else. If it was just the weather, you would never fly into it. But let's look at some specific pressure points like a master, master chef, cooking class or something like that. The first one's departures. Rich from ATC has basically said ATC don't really advocate the use of special VFR as a planning tool. Absolutely not. That's not the intent. Now, we know, oh yeah, there's always margins built into these things. All right, does, what is the visibility minima for special VFR for an aeroplane? 1,600. 1,600 metres. Not much. Really? And you're planning to do that? So, special VFR is not a tool to get out of the control zone, anything else like that. You're deliberately making a decision to erode a margin that's placed there for your safety. Does that sound like something a reasonable person would do? Okay, there's a term that goes with that. It punches around the lines of negligence. So departures are definitely something to think about. Along the way, avoiding weather. Usually the thing with avoiding weather is, is that it means more track miles. More track miles means more fuel and more time. Two things we don't really like to chew out. And what if you didn't take enough fuel? Now, some companies will have a policy on this, and that is, is that during the wet season they will enforce or mandate that 
an amount of contingency fuel is carried, regardless of the flight. That's a management strategy put in place to help mitigate the challenges that come with avoiding weather. But you can also apply a personal minimum on that. If you're looking at a fuel plant and you're seeing zero margin or a very small positive margin in the wet season, I would probably put it to you that you can do better. Avoiding weather for those who haven't had any experience avoiding it, to go around a thunderstorm, you might need an extra 40 track miles. In a 210, how long does that take to fly? Anyone who's current on the time. 15 minutes, thereabouts, yep. Litre a minute, that's 15 litres of fuel. And then you get back to Darwin, and this guy says, hold at Lee Point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right, now arrivals. Okay, this is the fun one. Um, airports are in a location they don't move. Weather moves to airports. Weather hangs around airports. Darwin has a particular couple of weather patterns that do hang around this airport from time to time. You're running late in the day, you're running low on fuel, you're getting towards your margins, um, and you want to get home. And there's a thunderstorm near the airfield. Not on it, because he can't see out of the town, and he can't tell you what's going on, and you know that's just pretty dumb. But it's just to the north of Lee Point. Is that going to pose a risk to the airport? Yeah, maybe. So these are the sorts of things you have to have a think about. The wind shear effects that Harry spoke about, um, these are all pressure points that factor into your flying. Mitigating that. Well, air traffic control at Darwin, just because they say make an approach, doesn't necessarily mean that that risk has been mitigated. Air traffic control can't provide that um, separational guarantee for you. Out at Manning Greeter, or Lake Avella, or Remanguinning, or all of those wonderful top end destinations, it's up to you. You may have to hold, you may have to divert, you may have to do something else. Trevor's got a story about that in a bit. Things to think about. And these are the common profiles. These are the things we see time and time again that come up. So, lastly, I want to talk about a couple of things that you can do. What do you reckon? I reckon, first thing, flying instructor, I'm always going to tell you to read your books and learn stuff. All right, each of you needs to look at ways of building that bag of experience I was talking about. And congratulations by attending here tonight, coming along and talking to people and listening for what you get out of it. You've had an experience. The bag of experience got slightly fuller. Well done. Talk to your friends. Talk about your experiences as you go along. But read things. Visit the bomb website, have a look at the Knowledge Centre. <coughs> Talk to the air traffic controllers at the tower party before they all get blotted. <laughs> <laughs> but develop your professional knowledge because that's where you can then make decisions considerate of risk. When you make a good decision, generally you're drawing on two things, technical knowledge and experience. Now, if you don't have a high level of experience, you then have to try and draw from a high level of technical knowledge, so pursue it. Other things you can do. Contingency fuel. I've mentioned it. I would suggest in the wet season, suggest half an hour. If you're coming back VFR late in the day to Darwin, we all know that there's thunderstorm activity across the wet season, you might like to carry about half an hour of margin. Something you need to analyse. Or drop short of Darwin, take on fuel to bring you home if payload's an issue. There's always a way. You just have to think about it, but there's always a way. Someone mentioned the poor man's weather radar. That's the uh, Oz Runways bomb website. Rich has mentioned the 10, 15 minute delay. Great tool for situational awareness. Not really definitive, but great tool for situational awareness. Now, modern day, Aircraft are getting G1000 and all sorts of wonderful things. All right, I dread the moment that we see a fleet of diamonds in Darwin. I think I'll stab myself in the eyeball with a plastic spoon when I do. But these aeroplanes invariably are going to commonly come with weather radars. So that means wake up and smell the new millennium. 
if you've got an aircraft with a weather radar, I often hear this from pilots, I say, oh, my aircraft has a weather radar. That's great, do you know how to use it? Do you know how to set the tilt? Do you know how to interpret the returns? Learn those things. Because you can read a lot from that particular equipment. And the last thing, we've spoken about risk and hazard and bad outcomes. We've spoken a lot about how to avoid. And this is probably a good point to bear in mind. Dealing with threats, errors, hazards. It's about avoidance, recognition and avoidance, but it's also about mitigators should you find yourself in Greg's position or should you find yourself with 178 seconds to sort your shit out. So things that you should be doing and working out as pilots, practice your IF skills. Everyone's got a computer at home, everyone can get a flight simulator, practice your IF skills. Even if you don't have an instrument rating, practice your IF skills. All right. I can't stress enough that when you get into a situation, you wish you had those skills, you wish you'd done the practice. Practice, practice, practice. It's like going to the gym. All right. So there is that. And upset aircraft recovery training or knowledge. Before I talk about why that's in place, I might just put it out there. Why would I want to talk about upset aircraft recoveries? It's the first time you might uh, realise that you've got problems seriously. Because when you have 10 seconds to live, you look out the window, you can see the ground and the trees rushing up, and you can even see the horizon, but if you turn your head far enough. And it's at a funny angle. Aeroplanes. Turbulence, penetration speed, manoeuvring speed. Aeroplanes have structural limits. Recovering upset aircraft, if you get inadvertent IMC and you lose control of the aircraft, you may get a window of opportunity to correct it. Usually the first you'll know about it is when you break out of the cloud into some level of visual reference. We talk about nose high, nose low, unusual attitude recovery. There's a range of things there, but the reason we talk about the specific techniques on one side, it's to avoid stalling the aircraft. On the other side, it's to avoid tearing it apart in flight. Fun facts. Aircraft have G-loading limits, section two of the flight manual. How are those G-loading limits affected with flap extension? Know that. How's it affected with weight? How's it affected with a range of things? Invariably though, you're likely to end up in a high speed situation. So exceeding a manoeuvring speed and then trying pretty sporting recovery techniques in a limited period of time is something that you probably really need to have some technical knowledge in. More fun facts. G limits on aeroplanes are generally only considered in the pitching plane. Nose up, nose down. They're not really considered in the flight manual against what we call rolling limits, which is the application of pitching G whilst rolling the aeroplane. Wings, wing spars, made of metal, they're really good at flexing. They're not really good at twisting. Typically speaking, the load factor limits in your flight manual have about a two-thirds limit for rolling G. A normal category aeroplane has a normal G limit of somewhere around about the three to four G mark. Two thirds of that knocks it down a little bit. There's specific numbers that elude me. But nevertheless, with rolling G applied, two to three G is very, very serious for that airframe, particularly at high speed. Remember, energy is all about the V squared bit. There's always a V squared. So every knot has a real, real impact. So maybe a few of you thought, hang on, where did all that come from? Okay, that's my point. You don't know what you don't know until you go out and find it. Read widely, talk to people, seek mentoring, seek skills development, so that you can come back and share your experiences. And so that the rest of us don't have to sit here and analyse. And that the rest of us can learn from lessons that perhaps you don't have to pay for. Thanks.
Our third SME that we're just going to hear from now is Trevor Woods from the Northern Territory Police Air Wing flying the PC-12. As you can see there, Trevor learnt to fly back in the mid-80s over in WA and is currently a senior pilot training and checking with the Police Air Wing. He has 11 years experience doing aeromedical work with RFDS and Pearl. And I think this wet season will be his 20th wet season, with about 13,000 hours. Please welcome Trevor Woods. Cameron talked about mitigation here tonight. And uh, the flight that I'm actually going to tell you about, talk to you about, is how I went through mitigation to actually do the complete flight. Now, um, I started with, we talked about two bags, one with experience, I didn't have much in it. But when I was, uh, my first started flying, my dad had a 150, so I put a few bits of experience in my bag straight away with dad. Once again, flying training, I had the luxury of having people with a lot of hours, grade one instructors to start my instructing and to do my training. Once again, from those guys, I put a lot more and more experience in my bag. And then I got my first job up in the Pilbara. Sort of semi, I didn't count it in the wet season, but that was semi wet season up there when I was up there. So a little bit in my bag again about wet seasons. And then uh, the next time, got an instrument rating. A couple more bits in my bag. It's all good. Headed up to Darwin in the mid 90s. Started flying up here, coming to my first wet season. I was lucky enough to get up here in, uh, it was about Easter time. So I had a whole year to get used to the aircraft I was flying. ATC and all the places I was going, after I couldn't pronounce their names, as you know. <laughs> so then I worked for a charter company up here, got enough experience on Conquest and went back to the RFDS. RFDS was a great training ground for me. And they kept on everything I did there with the chief pilot, training captains, all the ICAs I did, kept on filling my bag up, just kept on going and going and going. So I did ten and a half years there me. Up here with Pearl, when I was up here, so I started my check and training. Once again, from all that experience, kept on putting stuff in my bag. Came over to the police in, 90, in uh, 2009. We had a uh, guy doing a check and training, Peter Tippett, you might know, he's pretty well Mr. Pilatus from the world. Filled my bag up more. So I was very lucky, I had a good constant stuff throwing in my bag for this. So the flight that I'm going to talk to you about is mitigation. How I got through this flight. It was in uh, February 2011. It was just after Cyclone Carlos. It had just been through about three or four days beforehand. It was only a cyclone, it was only just a one. And it started over Daly River, back around to the west, back over Darwin, then it headed down the Kimberley and down the west coast of WA. Left a fair bit of weather here. Usually cyclones drain a fair bit of the weather away. But it left a lot of weather here. So I come out to work. We actually be back the planes away, down to Catherine on the Wednesday, and we brought them back over the weekend. One of the aircraft was US on the Monday. We all rocked up to work. We had two flights going. I got out, daily by plane, seven o'clock sign on, but the other plane was US, so we actually had to use my plane first up, so that's okay. I'll wait. So the other guy went out, flew out, come back again. I was meant to be airborne again by about 11.30. Obviously, like things happen, things got pushed back, just a little bit more time, refueling, and it wasn't until 12.30 I was departed. Now this flight, was well, going to be seven sectors in the afternoon. So it was going from Darwin to Tyndall, Tyndall to Noomba, Noomba to Lake Adela, Elko Island, Melangimbi, Manangrita back to Darwin. So that's a fairly big day, and half of it's sort already of all like gone. But I'd had rest. I was in at work. 
and I looked at, okay, this is going to be doable still. So this is where I had to start to reach into my bag of mitigation. Go through there, what's happening? I've had good rest, yes. Had lunch. I had a plane full of fuel, because we could take full fuel on the NG. And three people. We're taking officers back because they've been stuck in Darwin because of the weather, so we couldn't fly them to the North Pass. They had people everywhere, and we're just delivering people back into communities, our police members. So it was fairly important to get these people back on the ground. So, uneventful, we go to down to Tyndall, pick up another three members, so it's six people on board now, and we head out to Noongawa. When I was heading into Noongawa, most of this time we're in cloud actually, because of just the weather, it was just a wet season, so we broke out the cloud about 10,000 feet going into Noongawa, it's not a problem, visual approach into there. And when I was coming into land on one five, Towards the east, there was a fairly big thunderstorm there, probably about 10 miles away. We landed, not much time to actually offload our passenger was there, it was only one getting off, a bit of gear, and by this time the thunderstorm had pretty well developed in a matter of uh, five minutes to move close to us, which was probably too close for us to actually take off then, which I decided I'll wait on the ground, so I waited on the ground for an hour. So once again, pushed that time away. So I'm biting into my day again. After an hour, thunderstorm had uh, run its course and I'd head up to Lake Abella. 25 minutes up there. We could hear people going into Lake Abella. It's all okay, but on the plane, radar, storm scope, there was a mass of a couple of thunderstorms to the north from the west around to the north and all around to the east at Lake Abella. Not a problem. There's VFR planes going in there and it's virtually a isolated thunderstorm area there. So I land. We go backtrack down the runway. That's fine. Park up. Get out of the aircraft. It starts raining. The thunderstorms have moved from the north to us. There was lightning down south of us, to the east, south, north, west, every which way you want to go. So once again, mitigation, what I'm going to do? I've got to work out, I've got still another four sectors to go. It's not going to get back into town now, into Darwin, until late in the evening. So then, my thinking was, well, we might as well close the plane, stop all the water running in it at this stage. And we'll go down, have a cup of tea, wait for it to blow over. Not knowing at that time that it was probably going to be a supercell thunderstorm to stick around. So what I did was had points of working out the mitigation of when I'm actually going to take off. The latest time that I'm going to Lake, from Lake Abella to Elko and complete flying. And that was starting to get there now, it's starting to get to the 5.30 which I calculated. Still raining, still thunderstorms, still lightning everywhere. So I had to have a lot of plans. Plan, I'm up to plan like uh, C now. Well, I'm not gonna go over to Lake Abella. Maybe I could go to Manigrita on the way home if I leave a little bit later. Once again, that came up. That time went, what am I going to do now? Oh well, I'll wait till 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock was when I was going to go straight back to Darwin. I had guys on board, I had still five people to deliver around. They were needed in the police station, they were needed back there. They'd been absent for a good week because of the cyclone. So once again, talking about pressures that uh, put on us to go. But there wasn't one there because it's come to 7 o'clock. I'm staying. I'm staying at Lake Abella. I'm not going out. I'm not leaving, not taking off. 
previously to that flight, three weeks beforehand, our aircraft, our aircraft was struck by lightning. So I'm very aware that plane's actually been struck by lightning three times now. <laughs> so it's a big, big cost, a big time. And sitting on the ground at Lake Avella for a, it fixed to be a long, long time. So we decided to stay. We stayed the night. I had our clothes what we flew in. The other guys were there too. But we were all glad that we stayed that night because that thunderstorm didn't give up until 11 o'clock that night. It was overhead for a good five, six hours. So next day, what did we do? We got new weather, and I'm continuing on my flight that I did, had planned from the day before. Everything was fine. I ended up getting back in at 12 o'clock the next day. So I looked at my mitigations, what I did. So I made that decision. Each time I had a decision, everything was going south all the time. So I pull it back, make decision, go south, change my timings. I was lucky I had a lot of fuel and I had people that were understanding that wasn't quite right to fly in that weather. So that's my story. Thank you so much Trevor. Um, a lot of experience, aeromedical, flying police air wing around the territory. Just before we finish with our open panel to conclude the night, um, Greg Imlay just wants to come back and have a quick chat about the CASA perspective, I suppose Greg had his industry hat on for his first chat with us. But um, Greg would just like an opportunity just to, I suppose, give us a, a bit of a heads up as to the type of things that the regulator, the type of things that the CASA wants to see uh, and, 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 and expectations for, for flying around here in the top end, especially during the wet season time. Timber initially said CASA responsibilities. It's not really about CASA responsibilities, it's about what goes on. Uh, in these circumstances. And I'm talking about circumstances where someone might do the wrong thing by getting stuck in cloud. Someone might do the wrong thing by being reported going in the cloud. Someone might do the wrong thing by ATC helping them out getting down through cloud or something like that. It does happen. So I'm going to give you the cast of position on what this means. We all know there's rules about flying in cloud, and that's it there, for those of you who don't know. So the car, which is the head of power, says, CASA can notify the distances from cloud in AIP or no cameras. What CASA chooses to do is to put it in the AIP, and I've just got a few extracts, just a couple of them. This is the VMC criteria for class C, and it gives you the viz and the distances <coughs> of our horizontal vertical. The next slide is in class G, and there's a whole lot of subject two items there which I won't bore you with because you being commercial pilots, or most of you, should know all this from air law. And if you don't know it, go and read it tomorrow. It's not rocket science. But look, we can stick rules out there, like there's plenty of rules out there. Speeding, 100 kilometres. Don't drink and drive. Don't text and drive. People bust those daily. Why do we bust them? Because any one of those could kill you. Texting while driving, driving while drunk or under the influence of drugs, or speeding at the wrong place, and flying in a cloud can all kill you. Yet, as humans, we continue to do that, which is bizarre. If we were aliens looking down, we'd say, that's pretty strange. Why do we do that? There's a whole lot of reasons why. I won't go into that now. You know, peer group pressure, I'll just have another drink. Oh, come on, have another drink before you go. You'll be right. Oh, look, the cloud's not that bad. I'll just keep going. I'll get to it in a minute. No problem. I've done it before. What Cassia and the industry need to do is to work out why these things happen and why we keep doing that sort of stuff and establish some strategies, and that's what we're talking about. But let's move on to what happens if you do find yourself having to bust one of these rules. We have a regulatory philosophy, it's up on our website. 
I'll give you a chance to read it, but if you don't really want to read it, I'll just paraphrase the bits that are important. We've got a just culture, and it says, people aren't punished for actions, omissions, or decisions taken with them in a commensurate with their experience, qualifications, and training. So if you really didn't know it, and you really acted on the fact that you didn't know that because you weren't experienced enough, you didn't have training to know that, we do not take action. But there's a downside to that, of course, and I haven't highlighted that, but if you're negligent, reckless or willful, well, we might do something. Now, this is the same of any regulator. If you make a mistake on your tax return, you're likely to just get a nasty letter. If you do it repeatedly, for a lot of money, they're likely to take action. Same with us. Basically, it's not native. The next thing is, when we do take something, we adopt an approach that is encouragement of training and education with a view to remedying identified shortcomings and correcting physical. What's what we're doing now? So, our first action is to educate and train. We don't immediately reach for the pad and write you out a fine. This doesn't happen. Okay, so let's well, let's go back a bit. So let's we'll go through what happens if we get a report of someone flying a VFR aircraft into IMC without an instrument rating. Fortunately, we're getting that sort of report because we're not getting it from ATSB. Because if we're getting it from ATSB, you've probably crashed. The good thing is, you're still alive, because we're getting reports saying that pilot did this on this day, and they're living to tell the time. But you've broken the rule, so we've got to find out why. <coughs> now, in my nine or so years with CASA, I've never heard of anyone of CASA fining anyone for giving them any licence sanction or giving them any other grief apart from talking to them when such things have happened. When ATC have reported people to us for flying in cloud and stuff like that, when uh, ATC have had a report go through the system to say someone entered cloud and are a VFR pilot, I've never heard of CASA ever any of hunting those people down and finding them. I don't believe it's ever happened. If they've done it 20 times in two weeks, probably, yeah. But if they did it once, it's <coughs> unlikely to ever go anywhere near that. So what does happen? Well, let's have a look at an incident. Let's assume we get an incident report coming through our system. So the first thing we would probably do is try and work out how it happened. And this is a typical pathway. Those of you who know the uh, Reason model will know Swiss cheese. And what we're talking about here, I'm just going to highlight a very brief couple of things that could combine, as Cameron was saying, weather and. We're going to do what the ands might have been. Inadequate planning. I did that. Fatigue could be an issue. Get homeitis. Trevor was talking about that. Those people wanted to get home. Some poor decision making, didn't turn around at the right time. Or didn't go back, didn't divert. The others, they're some of the others. Didn't happen to have an IFR rating. And there's that bad weather sneaking in. They all combined to produce the IMC encounter. In this instance, let's assume that the pilot even after having all this go wrong, had attended one of Cameron's upset recovery training sessions and had a decent set of IFR skills, even though they didn't have a rating, and that they were high enough above the ground that when they popped out of the bottom of the cloud, they went, oop, all okay, and didn't overstress the aircraft. All okay. That's when we get to talk to the pilot and maybe the operator, if it's an ASC operation. How did all this happen? We know pretty well how this happens, and we can talk about that. It just happens. There's nothing you can do about it. But all this took 
the aircraft to the weather. The weather didn't come at you. And Trevor sitting there in wherever it was, Lake of Bella, the weather came to him then, but it was in the air. Every other time, you end up going to the weather. So what we need to discover is why that took place. So what we do is we get popped in. Tell us what happened. Tell us why. What reasons were there possibly for you to not have enough time to fly plane? And maybe not reading the forecast. Were you fatigued? Were those people wanting to get home or was that operation really commercially important that meant that you could toss a few things out the window? And when you were faced with the weather coming up in front of you, what were you thinking? What were your plans? Did you have a plan? Did you have a way out? Did you even think of turning back? Did you even think about not departing? We do this in a way to discover what this individual did or didn't do on that day. Because we could learn something from something they say that we could tell you. That person is unlikely to do that again. But that's just one individual. There's 117 in this room. This is one way we could get information that you may not have otherwise known and pass it on to you. Or put it in our handout. We'll do whatever we can, or we'll make a video, or we'll do something. So that's what we do. We look at all that stuff, and we talk to the pilot about what could have been done better, if there's operator influences in there, like excessive commercial pressures, like not giving people enough time to flight plan, like a whole other thing, we can take that up with the operator. But that's a different thing. But as far as the pilot's concerned, none of that leads to a sanction. If they go and do it ten times, it probably will. That's our role. That's what we do. Um, before I finish, I'm just going to move on to a little scenario to deal with this issue of commercial pressure because it's obviously important in any aviation enterprise. We're dealing with expensive equipment with lots of money invested. It doesn't earn any money on the ground. The people don't pay when they're sitting on the ground. So this is something I learned quite a long time ago. And the hazard here is commercial pressure. And this is a typical example of how it was mitigated in these instances. Trevor gave us a good example of how it happened here in the top end. This is a slightly larger and older example, but you'll get the idea. I had a mentor. He was a Qantas director. He was the chief executive of a big flying school that I ran in Cessna. He was a part-time director of the school. His Qantas seniority number was six or seven, so he was an old and bold dude. And he was rostered for command of QF1, which is the flagship service from London to Sydney. And they were in London. The flight used to leave at a specific time every day. Unbeknownst to the crew, operations moved the flight an hour early. The crew were in a hotel. All well, the flight attendants, everyone's in the same hotel. London operations send the crew bus to the hotel, expecting the crew to be outside in their uniforms like they all sit outside in the hotel and ready to go. No crew. Ring, ring. Where, where? Oh, no one to be found. Find the base manager who comes to the hotel, goes up and knocks on the captain's door. Captain opens the door. He's sort of in his jammies or whatever it is, cleaning. He's not ready yet. Because it's an hour early. Oh, Captain, uh, you know, uh, you're late. No, I'm not. You're late. Mm -hmm. This is when I was meant to be. Oh, they changed the time. Um, you've got to get going. Uh, you've got to get going right now. Oh, okay. Why? Uh, well, no, 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 we've got 400 people sitting at the airport waiting to get on QF1 to fly to Australia. Uh, no, that's not going to happen, he says. You're going to go back to the airport and you're going to tell traffic that the aircraft will depart one hour late. No, oh, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. It's 400 people. 
Princess Di is travelling to Australia on QF1 today. We can't do that. My mentor says, yes, you can, and make sure you tell her as well. <laughs> Sounds simplistic, but you can imagine the chaos that would cause. As it was related to me, he said, there's absolutely no reason in the world why we should short circuit the one hour preparation time we need after we drive it out of the airport and our preparation to get that aircraft, an analogue 747 and all its bits and pieces, ready to go. So I had a few slides here. I've got to go and do flight planning. I've got to do checklists and in Qantas 747 classics there's millions of them. The people are standing in the terminal. So the pressure is enormous. But this person had a presence of mind and probably the experience to say, no, we're not doing that. We are not going early. I'm not going to short circuit that. Now, this may seem an example that's quite above what the level of aviation new people may be engaged in. But the principle is exactly the same. If someone is telling you you've got to depart in 15 minutes and you need half an hour or 45 minutes, you need to develop a strategy in your circumstance to deal with that. Because if you don't, that inadequate planning will be up there as one of those latent factors that we may have to talk to you about down here, or worse, it might be ATSB writing the report for your relatives because you didn't have the time to do the plan properly. Each of you is in a different working situation with a different company, with a different mindset, with a different commercial attitude. But you're in charge of when you turn the key or press the button. So it's up to you to do that, to do that bit at least properly. So find a way. We can help. Find a way. And it will block that Swiss cheese pathway in your circumstance. Okay? Thanks for listening. If there's anything you want to uh, ask any of these guys, please put your hand up and away we go. We've got a question over here. Well, I shouldn't need a microphone. That's okay. Um, question just related to special VFR. Um, seen recently where the, the weather's been okay, a little bit of cloud on the deck. Um, get a clearance out of here. There are times I've asked for a special VFR just to get close to cloud. Would you prefer I do that or would you prefer me just to get five mile off track for stop climb at 500 feet just like it past the weather? I'm just trying to work out what's easiest. I mean, I could care less either way. But... Um, it's a bit contextual, so every situation is different. Um, the, the decision is always going to be yours. You're, you're going to have to decide what's going to be safest for you. Yep. Um, if you come and offer us to deviate or special VFR, if you give us the option to give you, that's that's a bit of a, an odd one, but I'd expect you just to decide what's going to be safest. Well, I, like, you... I like special VFR because it keeps me yep. on track, it keeps me on a constant climb, but after listening to what you said earlier about special VFR, uh, you know, uh, just not quite sure. Yeah. So I'll just uh, go on from there. Cameron touched on the visibility minima for special VFR. So special VFR, however, only applies inside class C. So if you are at the special VFR minima and you enter class G, you have breached that rule. Oh, it's close to cloud coming out of here. Not the visibility is close to cloud. So that, that, hence, that, I get that. So hence the reason why Cameron is suggesting that special VFR to depart immediately places you behind the eight ball because you are instantly leaving the control zone in a compromised situation. Yeah, not, no, not, not necessarily. necessarily. If, the, if the cloud base is at 1500, yep. uh, special VFR you apply just below it in class C, outside class, in class G, you, you are VFR. Look, I, anyway. yeah, that's, that's obviously a, 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 a case. What we find, however, when we get reports about people from the tower saying that, look, these people are going in our special VFR and the weather's really bad, like the weather is close to uh, non VMC, we're talking about. You're not talking about really a non VMC situation all over. No. You're just talking about going in a direction. That's a different matter. Uh, the, often we get reports from the tower and from people walking up Nightcliff Beach 
seeing aircraft coming up along at very low levels with a cloud base that is pretty low to the ground. And yes, inside the control zone, special VFR could be permissible. Um, but in that circumstance, if you did depart and the weather was such that uh, in the entire control zone, you had to have a special VFR to stay under the cloud, if that weather existed outside the control zone, you would immediately have breached the VFR rule, which is not a good place to be, back to that 1600 metre visibility issue. Um, so that's our take on what we get from reports and what we advise people to do. If you have to get out on a special VFR clearance with widespread bad weather, as soon as you're outside the zone, you're not being seen. Uh, now, the special case you're talking about might be different. Anyone else? The criteria for uh, expect instrument approach versus expect visual approach. Sometimes it just doesn't seem to make any sense. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, so a lot of the time it's going to be based off sector observations. So we may actually be at a stage where we've gone expect instrument approach because of a certain portion of the airspace is, is no good, whether visibility or cloud. But we know for a fact, based on the sector observations, that you are probably going to get visual from the north or something. The way weather works in Darwin, the north might be completely, completely clear and the south might be completely and utterly soup. So when it comes to that, generally we're going to go off a general observation. If it's more likely that aircraft are going to require an instant approach, we'll just put expect instant approach on the ATIS. Um, that's not saying that the entire airspace is completely souped out and visual approaches are not available. It's just an expectation from us. So we'll, we'll make it a judgment, a general judgment, and that's all we really can do with the ATIS. The ATIS is just a very, very general piece of information. But, um, yeah. And what height uh, would you base that on? Generally, the, the 3,000 feet, the MSA, or would you use a radar? Because some days you sort of sit here scattered at uh, two and it's still visual approaches, and other days it'll be few at three and a half. Yeah, like if you're coming in from the north, uh, we, can, we can even vector you all the way down to 1.7 or 1.8, depending on where you are. We're vectoring off uh, what we call our RTCC, overlaid onto the screen. So we don't necessarily have to use the MSA. We're looking at the screen, we're using an RTCC. So generally speaking, if it's few at two or scattered at two, it may be completely confined to a certain part of the airspace. And if we've got aircraft coming in from the north who we're pretty certain can still maintain visual, there's not gonna be an issue with that. But um, in terms of the specific criteria, it's really, as I said before, it's gonna be a general assessment of the, of the airspace. Uh, this is directed at Cameron. Uh, you mentioned before about uh, weather radars and I guess learning how to use them properly. I've had a look myself online and in, um, uh, in uh, user guides and flight manuals and things to find some good information on weather radars and I haven't really found anything to use. Do you know anywhere where there's good resources or where to find information like that? As with most things, uh, the first place I would uh, counsel you start is the manufacturer's um, guide. All right, it's going to be the, the first place I'd look, and that's probably to going to give you direct instruction on how the functionality of the equipment works. So what all the buttons do, and what the modes and the selections are. And to be honest with you, I think the best way to capture it is to read several different articles. You'll get little snippets of good stuff out of each. For example, if you Google search how to set the tilt on a radar, you'll get a story about altitude in thousands of feet, drop the thousands, tilt the radar down till you get ground return at that distance, tilt it up seven to eight degrees, good to go. You know, rough kind of settings. So you'll be, you will definitely get that sort of information. Setting the tilt is one of the common things that people tend to struggle with to get the most amount of value. And also, interpreting the radar return. So you'll find articles on that kind of thing. You mentioned the PC-12 has got struck by lightning. Um, what kind of damage um, did they get from that? Cha-ching. Cha-ching. <laughs> Cha so what happens when, a, what happens when a, a PT-6 engine or most turbines get struck by lightning, it normally comes in through the spinner. So the, the shaft that is going through the engine normally gets instantly magnified. Uh, the way they check for that is they walk up with a handful of uh, paper clips and they throw it at the uh, engine case and if they stick, it's magnetised. That means it's got to come out. So you can imagine getting struck by lightning in Wolfville. The engine's got to come out right there. And if it's a PC-12, for instance, not normally the loaner engine might be in Canada. So it's got to come out or wherever it is and get stuck in the airplane. Uh, there will be an exit hole somewhere. 
and in PC12s they've got some carbon fibre, it normally goes down a wing tip or a tail. Um, when I joined the air wing uh, in 99, uh, uh, one of our aircraft had been struck by lightning sometime before, it just got back in the air, but for two years after that, just about every electrical component, one after the other fell over, until we replaced just about everything. So the effects of lightning strikes in certain aircraft, particularly modern ones, are long lasting for an owner or an operator. But basically the first thing is the engine uh, will, get, will normally get a hit. Um, I don't know what happened in Trevor's instance, but uh, that, that's the story. But again, uh, that's class of aircraft is probably not specifically designed to be struck by light. Uh, airliners probably have better defences. Okay, so that was out at uh, Manningrita area, I think, and the aircraft was actually on the ground there for quite a while. And I wasn't very at the shipping, but they would have uh, done the repair out there, put the spare uh, motor engine in and fly it out. Second time, it was actually probably I think actually just before Cyclone Carlos actually, and uh, <coughs> looking back now, our, one of our pilots is flying back through, very clear of the weather, coming back through Jabiru area, going to Kara, Gator as we do, that star coming in, and it was struck by lightning then. The pilot only saw a big flash, didn't know, didn't feel it hit the aircraft, but once it landed, knew there was a big chip out the propeller and uh, exit out of the tail. So once again, lunar engine and another three or four weeks before a new one comes back in again after it's been done up. And then you've got to change it back over again, so it's a big expense. It's about, it all depends on it because of insurance and stuff. Time stuff's expired on the aircraft, on the engine, they uh, only give you pro rata. So sometimes it's probably around about three to five hundred thousand. And if you Replace uh, propeller blades, probably 25, 30,000 as well, if you can find them these days. And the second time, the third time, it was flying out of uh, Alice Springs, it was flying from Tanner Creek back to Alice, and that was a thunderstorm that they had a fair, I suppose they were around about 50 miles away from that thunderstorm itself, and the lightning had come out horizontal and struck the aircraft. So it was a fair way away. There wasn't any diversions at the time. I followed an aircraft in. Cameron would be aware of this one. One of the Beach 1900s of uh, Vincent's was going to um, Jabiru. There was one fairly small queue, about 15 miles to south of <coughs> Jabiru. I was following in. It was probably about 10 minutes apart behind. And they landed. I landed behind them. And they were over having out the look at the right hand engine, all sad faced and everything. I said, What's wrong, guys? They said, We get struck by lightning. I go, Lightning? That cloud that was just down the south, I'd hardly picked it up on the weather radar. It was showing a little green on the weather radar. Isolated, we we're in clear sky. And it had shot out 10 miles, or 15 miles, horizontal lightning, hit the propeller, and uh, exited the aircraft wing. And we're in blue sky. Yeah. <coughs> Just out of interest, who here has had a lightning strike before? Not me? Oh, same plane. Yeah. Same plane on the I've been in a Dash 8 that got hit by lightning, but that's about it. We also have Bob from Darwin International Airport. If you have any airport related questions, please. We've <laughs> <laughs> got a lightning story. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fire away, Bob. Thanks. Uh, Gerard asked earlier about the <coughs> storm warning system that we have on airport and it's, it's there for good reason for the ground handlers but uh, uh, during a thunderstorm one afternoon ATC had asked Safety One for a water depth assessment on the runway and uh, they'd gone out and done that with one of our seasoned safety officers and uh, many of you will know Mike Clancy, our airside ops manager, his second day on the job and uh, we got a call from ground um, we think safety one's been struck by lightning on taxiway Bravo 2. And so we were expecting the worst. I was a member of the rescue party. We went out to the vehicle. They were fine, they were dazed. Uh, the lightning had struck a taxiway light about two metres away from the vehicle and it wasn't going anywhere. We had to tow it back. And uh, it was a brand new diesel land cruiser. And so much energy went into the ground and around that vehicle it fried everything under the 
under the dashboard and the panel was $20,000 to repair. So that's an indication of uh, lightning power on the ground. Anything else for the airport while I'm here? <laughs> um, to Rich, um, with Darwin being very, um, uh, lots of controlled airspace, restricted airspace around, um, you spoke about the request and require comment. Um, if there's active restricted airspace and pilots require that or require to fly through that, um, does the term require allow pilots to fly into that airspace? And also, how do how do restricted airspaces get controlled from ATC? This is a really good one for us. It's actually so important to ATC. It's part of our core theory, uh, what to do if an aircraft is forced to fly into restricted airspace. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where you really only have two choices, to fly into the weather or to fly into restricted airspace, the diplomatic answer I'll give you is don't fly into the weather. Uh, at that stage, when you fly into that restricted airspace, when you're given no choice, we have a certain list of actions that we have to take. Uh, the first action is to cancel your control services. So we're making it very clear to you that you're not flying on an airways clearance when you enter that restricted airspace. The reason for that is because we may not own it. And we may not own it and we may not know what's going on in it. So we certainly can't have you operating under an airways <coughs> clearance from us uh, when we don't actually know what's inside the airspace. And from there, we have a checklist of actions. One of them will be to continue to uh, provide you a flight information service. So we're not going to just stop talking to you, but we're going to be telling you that you're now proceeding at your own risk. We don't know what's in the airspace. It's not ours or it may not be ours. You're proceeding at your own risk. Uh, I would suggest that the safety of, or the risk of flying through restricted airspace versus the risk of flying through an active cell is, uh, is you know, you can probably work out what is less hazardous immediately. But, uh, and from there, we continue our, an alerting service. So uh, we'll actually go to an alert phase, we'll instruct you to squawk 7700 um, and, and go from there. So it's actually stipulated pretty clearly what we're to do. Um, a big part of it is you're not under our clearance anymore we, and we, we have to stack that to you. Um, it's very important that we can't tell you necessarily everything that's going on there because uh, it may not be ours. Hey guys, look, thank you so much. Um, I'd like you all to please give a round of applause to all of our SMEs. <laughs>